Is your heart prepared to worship God now through hearing of his word? So let's join our hearts in prayer together. Lord, as we meet as your new covenant people, we just pray, God, that through your spirit, you would speak through your word. We thank you for the spirit's illumination of the gospel and how we came to faith and how you continually work in our lives to make us into your image. You are continuing to sanctify us, to make you more like yourself. And Father, we, we pray if there's any gathered here today that have not come into that saving relationship, to trust in Jesus as their only Savior, their only Lord, uh, we pray that you would continue to awaken them to their need. And as we take communion, would you use today's sermon to prepare our hearts? You have been unfolding your plan throughout history, and we're glad to be the people at the end of the ages, who get to see your completion of all the promises of a coming Savior, a final sacrifice. So help us to understand these things as we open up your word today. Bring conviction where needed and encouragement where needed. May you be glorified in all things. And may we truly worship you this morning as we engage with your holy word, we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. We are going to be in 1 Corinthians again, and we are going to be looking at verse 11. But until then, I want to do another introduction to the church at Corinth. So as we look at, I think this was my first sermon in uh, 1 Corinthians. If we picture a city like Cedar Rapids, uh, we have a gentleman here from Cedar Rapids. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Cedar Rapids is roughly maybe 200,000. Somewhere in there. Corinth, maybe give or take some. Uh, Corinth was 150 to 200,000 people. And it was a very diverse community. And uh, so Paul started a church there. Him and some other people share the gospel, and people are coming to faith, and they start meeting as a congregation. So when I first did my, my very first sermon, I mentioned we too are an assembly of God's people, much like the assembly at Corinth. As a matter of fact, I would say out of all the letters in the New Testament that we can most identify with in our culture, it would be the letter of 1 Corinthians. You see a lot of need for the church to understand what our Christian ethics all about. How are we to live? And so we're seeing that in the book of Corinth. Uh, 1 Corinthians, the city is Corinth. So in chapter 1, it starts right out. We are God's assembly. And so let me give you some markers that I took away from looking at the New Testament and what it says about the Christian assembly. First of all, it's God's assembly. It is a community of redeemed people. So the idea is that we go out into our neighborhoods, our workplaces, communities, and around the world. But church, our assembly is mainly of redeemed people. Now we do invite non-believers, do we not? But the assembly is made up largely of those who are redeemed, those who know Jesus Christ in a personal, saving way, and we worship through different means as we gather here today. It's a community that has baptism as its initiation. So let me just say it again. If, if you've trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, the very next step is to identify him in baptism. So we see that in the New Testament. It's a community that reminds themselves of their Savior through what we're going to do at the end of service. By celebrating communion as the Lord, what? Commanded. We also see that it's a community concerned with pleasing God. That is, we have a new ethical system. By the way, if you, if you have your Bibles open or a Blue Pew Bible, let's just take a look for a second of what kind of people did the, was the Corinthian church made up of? And you find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, or adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. What he's saying is, you probably identified with one of these groups. That is, as we see in the rest of the New Testament, we all have a universal, there's a universal problem. And we're sinners who want to go our own way. And maybe you could say, yeah, I can identify with a few things in that list. And maybe you're here this morning saying, well, I, I can't be identified with anything in that list. Well, in Romans it says in 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And chapter 3, verse 10 of Romans says, there's none righteous, not even one. Now, I wouldn't put you on the spot, but if I named each of those actions, could you identify with these? And what does he say? Such were some of you. There's an encounter that happened when Christ came into your life and he's cleansed you and he's made you his. And now you're part of a new community. And so in, 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 in the letter of 1 Corinthians, he has to address again immorality chapter 5 and 6. I'm not going to preach that again. But he had to deal with that. He had to deal with Christians suing one another. He had, a, he had to deal with Christians uh, bickering and backbiting and splitting up into groups. That's in chapter 1, 2, and 3. So we're community concerned. That's where we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians. You might say, Kendall, I thought Christianity was all about believing certain things. Is it? Absolutely. Is the Christian faith about believing certain things? And the answer is yes. Somebody over here might said, I thought basically Christianity is all about how you live. That would only be partially correct. Is Christianity about also how you live? And the answer would be absolutely. We see that all throughout the New Testament. So we're a community of believers that believe certain things about Jesus, who, how he's revealed himself. We're also a community, now that we're identified in Christ, we have a new ethical system. That's what we've been seeing uh, and by the way, it's not just in 1 Corinthians, it's in Ephesians, it's in Colossians, it's in 1 Thessalonians, it's in 1 Peter. That as God's new covenant community, we do believe certain things, but we also have a new ethical system. Also, we see that it's a community that worships God. I mentioned that at the beginning of our service as we gather to sing. It's a community that disciplines itself. We saw that in chapter 5. It's a community that exercises. We haven't gotten there yet, and it, it, who knows when we'll get to chapter 12. But it is a community that exercises God-given spiritual gifts. That is, if you're a Christian, God has gifted you with a spiritual gift to be utilized in the body of Christ. And we'll talk about that when we get there. I'm not going to put a date on it. So now, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just to remind you that Paul was an apostle who addresses this church. He's an apostle by the will of God. And he says it's to the assembly of God, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Jesus Christ, saints by calling, with all who in every place, in Philippi, Thessalonica, who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I just felt like I needed to take a pause because we've been dealing with some tough things in chapter 10, right? Idolatry, fornication, last week grumbling. Those are all ethical things. And I thought it'd be good to remind you that Christianity is, yes, dealing with ethics, but the first foundational point is that our identity is in Christ and what he's done. So the only reason we have a different ethical system is because we have a different belief system now. And we see that right out of the gate in chapter 1. Chapter 15, let me show you how he started the church with a certain foundational belief system. He says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. So he's reminding the congregation of the good news that he preached to them, which also you received, in which also you what? Stand. This idea, we've been seeing this in, in 1 Corinthians. Are you still standing in the gospel? 
by which also you are saved, and conditional clause here, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless this would be true of you. Unless it would be a vain kind of belief that wasn't truly bringing about a regenerate heart and new ideas, a new creation in Christ. Chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed. Behold, the new has come. So are you still believing these certain things? And is there evidence in your life of being regenerate? That's what he means here. It's, it's a scary thought, a little bit. He's asking them, unless you believe in vain, because there's going to be some in Corinth that deny when we get to chapter 15. Some of you will be retired by then, probably, but um, that we're denying a resurrection of the body. Can you be a Christian and deny the resurrection of the body? Because if you deny a resurrection of the physical body, are you not denying the physical resurrection body of Jesus, which Paul elaborates on in chapter 15? He says, I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Remember that as we take communion. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures. That He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve, and after that He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, and most of whom, when Paul wrote this in early AD 50, probably 53, 54, he says, remain until now, but some have, some have died. So definitely a belief system. Now let's bring ourselves up to chapter 9. This race that we first began. Verse 24. This is just introduction, yeah. Do you not know that those who run in a race, who run in a race, all run, but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. I discipline my body, Paul says. Make it my slave, so that after I've preached to others, I myself would not be disqualified. This is... This is the springboard into chapter 10. Do you want to run the race and do you want to finish? Or is it going to be known that you have just, you've dropped out of the race? And so in chapter 10 he says, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers, our ancestors, were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. We're all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Notice the word all. Meaning, all of you signed up to get the t-shirt. And i got to give these t-shirts. I've been using this for like six weeks. How many have run this seven, what is it, seven mile? Bricks, is it called? Race? Bix, sorry. Bix. Bix is the thing in Europe, right? Do you know whose shirts these are? Denise ran this race, and they're clean, by the way. Pam ran them through the washer and dryer. There you go, Denise. I just want to sign up next time and get the T-shirt because there's some nice T-shirts. I don't plan on running the race. Now, how many of you said that's crazy? Paul says, look, you can sign up to get the T-shirt, but the question is, are you actually going to run the race? What are you in it for? Are you in it to win it? Are you in it to finish? Now, if you're a Christian, if you believe in who Jesus claimed to be, and you're a follower of his, guess what? You are in this race. Hebrews chapter 12, Paul at the end of his life in 2 Timothy said, I have run what? I have run the race. I have finished my course. Then he gives warnings. And he shows the continuity that we have with these Old Testament saints. They were connected with these physical things, but did they truly have a regenerate heart? And what we're seeing is some of them did and some of them didn't. Some of them experienced temporal judgments. God took them out, according to the text. And there's also a warning, a spiritual judgment. 
So we've seen that. So it says, nevertheless, even though they experienced those external things, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. And so we've been seeing these examples. These examples are for you and I. These Old Testament examples, God inspired Moses to write them, and he inspired Paul to pull them out of the Old Testament because he said those things, they're written down for us. These examples so that you and I would not crave evil things as they craved and stood in judgment. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, verse 7. Don't act, uh, let us act sexually and moral. Pornea is the Greek word. Everything outside of one man, one woman, covenant relationship. And you see there was judgment with each one of these. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did. Nor let us grumble as some of them did. And with each one, there was judgment. Now what we've said with each of these is repentance is a huge deal in the Christian life, is it not? Paul in his second letter is going to say, I'm I'm broken, I'm sad. That there's some who have not repented. Why? Because Paul sees this contradiction. Repentance is a marker of regeneration. That's why church discipline exists. So in the Old Testament, God was bringing judgment. And in the New Testament, Paul's saying the church must deal with these things because we, we have a new ethical system. You're, all right, you're like, Kendall, why did you disrupt your sermon series? Well, verse 11, I couldn't get around this week. These things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction. Upon whom the ends of the ages has come. Like, here's the cross, first century when Jesus died. Paul is saying all of these events that happened in the Old Testament, they were inspired and written down for whose instruction? These new covenant believers that would be inheriting all the promises that the Old Testament predicted would happen. Clear back in Genesis, God promised Abraham that all the nations would be blessed through a descendant who would come through him. And then there's little hints all the way throughout the Old Testament, oh, there's going to be one who comes who's going to bring in the kingdom. Isaiah 53 says the Lord's servant is going to give himself as an offering for sin. He's going to atone for sin, Isaiah 53. Have you read Isaiah 53 lately? He was pierced through for our transgressions who is the servant of the lord who is yahweh himself who's going to atone for his people's sins we get to the new testament what do we see we got a guy riding in a chariot and uh, uh, a guy from ethiopia and he happens to be reading isaiah 53 and philip gets in this chariot and says let me explain who isaiah was writing about he's writing about jesus and he gets saved so all these old testament promises guess what When the new covenant comes, we are the people at the end of the age who now stand with everything written for our instructions to live this life because we live as a people who have seen these things come to fulfillment. Who's in a better position to serve and live for God? The new covenant people or the old covenant people? The new covenant people. The new covenant, the book of Hebrews says, is far better, has better promises, better sacrifices, because we have a better mediator. So when I was pre- uh, preparing this week to move on and finish up with chap- chapter 10, verse 11, 12, and 13, I, I thought, I-, I can't. This is very fascinating. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Written. These Old Testament examples, they're written for our instruction. One of the best ways to read the Old Testament is to read from their failures and say, I don't want to do what they did. That's why Paul is giving them these examples. Please learn from other people's examples rather than your own. And we know this, some people don't even learn from their own bad examples. I say this every Sunday. How many of you would rather learn from somebody else's mistakes than your own? Yes. That's why he said these things have been written. That's why they were inspired to be written down. 
Because us, now that the cross has come, we are the people of God of whom these promises have now been fulfilled and are being fulfilled until the second coming of Christ. That's exciting. So let me just show you here. Already, Paul throws hints. So I think this is, what, this is how you can be empowered by your Christian life. The person that I'm believing in is the one who was prophesied in the Old Testament. I'm following him. And so Paul is dropping these nuggets of truth all the way through this letter. Not like the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is all about that. But he says this, clean out the old leaven, this is chapter 5, so that you may be a new lump. This is Old Testament language. Just as you in fact are unleavened. Like, you're like, I don't even understand what that means. I know because it's, he's pulling it from the Old Testament. But what you can understand is this. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. So for 1,400 years, the Jewish people in April, March and April, sacrificed lambs every single year. Flooded Jerusalem with lambs. So the Passover lamb is being slaughtered. Christ comes along and He is the final Passover lamb, which I'm going to talk about at the end of service. And the book of Hebrews says all those Old Testament sacrifices, the Day of Atonement and all those sacrifices, Jesus comes along and He makes one final sacrifice and put an end to all sin. He purged His people from all of their sin. The book of Hebrews says all of those types and shadows, they're all fulfilled in Christ. And so what I'm afraid can happen is, you, you've been listening to this series on ethics, but don't forget the foundation starts with what you believe about Jesus. If your ethical system, bedrock foundational system, is not based on Christ and faith in Him, and I want to glorify God in my marriage and how I work, how I raise my kids, I want to be grace-centered. I want to be Christ-centered. I want to be biblically-centered. If we just start talking about ethics, well, the, your, your, your co-workers and neighbors can have some kind of ethical system. But this is a Christian ethical system. Which our foundation is, my, my Passover lamb has been sacrificed. He put an end to all of my sin. That should be the power that causes us to live for our king, the one who's provided for us. So you see these nuggets of truth. In chapter 8, when he's trying to wean them from idolatry, he says, yeah, the nations have these idols, so-called gods, but we know they're nothing. He says, yeah, for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him you know that he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and he includes the Messiah as covenant Lord? Co-equal with the Father? What do you, what, what's he saying here? Uh, you better expand your view of who God is. The New Testament clearly calls Jesus Creator. Father, Son, Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal can all be claimed to have brought creation into existence. And so those who deny the deity of Christ, the book of Colossians was written for them. Because the book of Colossians clearly, if you're in 1 Corinthians, if you just turn over to the right, the reason Paul's not really getting into this that much in 1 Corinthians is because it wasn't a problem in Corinth. But in Colossae, there were those who were wanting to denigrate the deity of Jesus. And so in chapter 1 of Colossians, you have a solid belief system before he gets into ethics. Verse 15, he is the, speaking of Jesus, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You can spend a whole sermon on what firstborn means, the preeminent one. Why is he preeminent? Why is he firstborn above all creation? Because he brought creation into existence. I've got a whole sermon on that. Look what he says. The reason he's preeminent over all creation is for by him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. 
All things have been created through Him and for Him. All things have been created. What? All things have been created through Him and for Him? How could a mere creature say that? How could this be said of a mere creature? So in chapter 2, he talks about Christ. In Him, the full deity dwells in bodily form. And then he gets into what Christ is atoned for. He talks about atonement in chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Look at chapter 1. He talks about atonement, which we're going to deal with today. You and I were formerly alienated and hostile and engaged in evil deeds, yet He's reconciled you in His fleshly body through death, get this folks, to present you before Him holy and blameless, beyond reproach, if you continue in the faith. In chapter 3, let's get into ethics. Chapter 3 is all about ethics. Say no to your old life, how you lived. Consider the members, chapter 3, verse 5. The members of your earthly body is dead to immorality, impurity, evil passions and desires and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is going to come upon the sons of disobedience. You used to walk in them when you were living in them. Put aside anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech. Don't lie to one another. Put on the new self. And he gets into positive characteristics. How many are following me so far? i got to focus my life on the person and work of Jesus as a foundation for my life, which carries over into the ethics of my life in Christ. Folks, if you can get this down, you can understand the New Testament. And so what you're going to see in the New Testament is what we always see. What? Promises and warnings. The guardrails that keep us walking the walk of the Christian faith. At times, some of you need the promises of God. And other times, we need the warnings of God. And God is using both of those. But if you can understand this, the Christian life makes sense. God has a redeemed people. Titus 2, verse 13 and 14. Whom he's purchased with his own blood and, and freed you from all of your lawless deeds to purify for himself, listen to this, a people zealous for good deeds. Or purchase people, his work, his purchase people, who are zealous for good deeds. Let's be known as a church who has solid beliefs about the Christian faith, but then we're zealous, zealous for good deeds among us and in our communities. And folks, if we get that down, Sometimes the reason I take a break is to do something like this, an overall sermon, to where you can get a hold of it, to where you can communicate this message to others. Because this, this worldview is how we ought to look at the Christian life. And it's all over the New Testament. You remember when it said, all drank from the spiritual drink? They were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was... Christ? And you're like, okay, first century Christ comes on the scene. When did that event happen? 1,400 years back here. What's the Bible teach? The Son is pre-existent, co-eternal with the Father. In so many passages. The Gospel of John, for Abraham was, I am. John chapter 17, Father, restore to me the glory which I had with you before the, before the world was. Who was it that was standing there? So if you look at Exodus chapter 17, Yahweh is saying, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water will come out of it, that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders, and he did this on other occasions as they're leaving Egypt, making their way to the promised land. And so they praise Yahweh as the rock, for I so in Deuteronomy 32, for I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect. All of his ways are just, a God of faithfulness without injustice. How in the world can Paul take such words on his own lips and say, you know, let me tell you, that rock was Christ. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, sharing the same attributes distinct in person, in their nature. The Son willingly steps out of heaven 
2,000 years ago to fulfill the Old Testament promises, to be a sacrifice for sins, the, be, the lamb that we need, fully God, fully man. So there's a lot of passages I could share with you about this idea of the rock in the Old Testament. The Psalm 78, if you want to read it later, talks about God being that rock. So what happened was it's not like they had this. John, I'm sure you used this at FCA. Did you have a bunch of water uh, you know, containers all week long? It wasn't like Jesus is this, you know, big old canteen following them along. No, what happened was Pam and I go down, we went down to Missouri, seven large springs coming up out of the rock. And I don't, sorry, I don't have a picture of this huge rock. If you, how many have ever floated on the current river? There are springs coming out of this rock, millions of gallons. There's seven large springs. So this is what I picture. If you go back and read these passages. Oh, God gave physical water, all right. But he's their spiritual rock and sustenance who was protecting them and providing them. And Paul comes along in 1 Corinthians 10.4 and says, I'll tell you who was following them. Who's the spiritual rock back then? It was Christ. And yet you look in all these passages and Yahweh is being praised. That he, you know, right? God is the one. Trim, look at Psalm 114. Tremble, O earth, before the Lord, before the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water and a flint into the fountain of water. So I'm standing here, as, if you think about it, this fresh spring water. This is what happened to the Israelites. God is providing for them. And Paul has no problem coming over to the New Testament and enlightening our eyes. He's the Passover the Lamb. All things came into existence by him and for him. Same thing is said of the Father. So what are we building? A case for what we need to believe to be Christians, and at the same time having no problem talking about how we live ethically. And usually people fall off the horse on one of two sides. Eh, I'm not into, you know, how you live for Christ. That, that sounds like religion to me. It's all about my belief in God. That's what I, I focus on. Well, you're going to fall off the horse then, because that's not a biblical view. We have both. The other side, yeah, it's all about how you live. And our, our, count, our city has a lot of people who says, well, you know, I can live as a Christian without believing all that stuff. It's all, God, all God cares about is how you live. How many people in this town believe that lie? Most. I live just like you guys do. And as a matter of fact, there are some non-believers that live better than a lot of believers. How many people in our town believe, you know, all God cares about is you leave a pretty decent life. What's missing? <laughs> You'd have to be perfect to believe that. God demands perfection. What have you done with your sin? Oh, I think God's going to weigh all my good on one side and all my bad on the other side. If the good outweigh the bad, I'm getting in. That's a lie out of the pit of hell, and most people believe that. They, just, they believe it. And you say, what are you basing that on? That's just what I think. Aren't you glad that you have... God has revealed himself? No, you need a savior. You'd have to be perfect in order to save yourself that way. And yet, on the other hand, as Christians, we say, we believe these things, but God has also called us to live differently. So this is where you're like, get that picture out of here. Okay. Um, Hebrews. Hebrews does the same thing. Really, this is preparation for what we're getting ready to do. Is to worship through taking communion. Hebrews, let me remind yourself, we took three years to go through Hebrews. And if you weren't with us then, they're, they're online. It, to me, as a pastor, it was one of the best studies I've ever done. First time I ever preached through Hebrews. Listen to how Hebrews starts out. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, in many ways, in these last days he's spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, and he, the Son, is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. Let me just say this. If you don't believe that, you probably shouldn't take communion. You know why? Because it's what you believe also in order to be a Christian. Do you agree with Colossians 1? Do you agree with Hebrews 1, 3? The exact representation of his nature upholds all things by the word of his power. And here's the atonement part. When he made purification of sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on height. Now verse 10. I, I think the best chapter, best book out of all the 
Bible to talk about the deity of Christ and his work is Hebrews 1. But for the sake of time, I got to just got to bring up verse 10. He says this of the son. He says, you, O Lord, Yahweh, in the Hebrew. He's quoting Psalm 102, 25, and 27. You, O Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Establishing the person and work of Jesus and if you just read 7, 8, and 9, folks, we have a better, new, the new covenant is better. Better promises, better mediator, better atonement. Don't go backwards, the writer of Hebrews says. Last verse in Hebrews that I'll quote, 9.26. Otherwise, talking about the difference between Jesus the high priest and the old covenant priest. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. Here it is. But now once at the consummation of the ages. That's just like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now at the consummation of the ages, the promised one has come and fulfilled what was spoken previously. I love this. Now at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. If you read chapter 7 and 8 of Hebrews, Jesus is undefiled, without sin, and he is the high priest that didn't need a sacrifice for himself like the Old Testament priest. And guess who is the sacrifice? This is vivid language. The writer of Hebrews says he himself is the sacrifice who obtained eternal redemption for his people. And then at the very end of the book, what does he say? Be zealous for good deeds. Go out and help people. Be a blessing. Why? Because you have a redeemer. You're his people. Let me just ask you, does this make sense? Do your heads like this, if you're still with me. And, and if it doesn't, get with me, because I don't really know how I can make it any plainer. Is the greatest thing for you to be a believer, to be saved? Excited that you're a child of God because of your faith in Jesus Christ. You've been forgiven of all of your sins. You've been given the gift of eternal life, and you're going to reign with him forever. You've been justified, declared righteous, not based on what you've done, but based on what he has done. And for the thrill of knowing that ought to be the foundation of the rest of this. So when Jesus, who does he think he is? God commanded that they celebrate the Passover every year. They take a lamb, they take herbs, and they do this Passover meal and they were commanded to do it. And Jesus says, I want to do it one last time with you guys. Now think about the audacity of him, Jesus. When the hour had come, he reclined at table and the apostles with them. And he said, I've earnestly desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And we had taken the cup and given thanks. He said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And you can let the kids in, guys. Let me just tell you, at our church, even though we have a children's class, come on in, come on in. They're part of the body of Christ. And for these kids who, listen, if you're old enough to believe in Jesus, you're old enough to be baptized and to take communion. Amen? So we believe in confessor's baptism. Believer's baptism. And parents, you are the ones who know where your kids are at spiritually. So we welcome all believers to the table this morning. Because notice what Jesus is going to say, friends. Listen. Think about how bold this is. When he had taken some bread, so that was the last Passover and the first Lord's Supper. He takes the bread, and he broke it. We're passing out broken bread this morning. Take this, 
This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten and said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant. What I'm getting ready to do, friends, is inaugurate the new covenant. What was spoken of in the Old Testament has now come to be fulfilled at the consummation of the ages. So we are the people that live in this time period. Excuse me. Move Jesus over here. Are you excited that we live in the consummation of the ages where all these promises have been fulfilled in Christ and all that we're waiting for now is the inauguration of His final kingdom? Right now, he's gathering spiritual people. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this in obedience to Jesus. Amen? Are you ready to worship? By being obedient to King Jesus as his new covenant people that he purchased with his own blood to say thank you for saving this sorry soul. And Lord, I want to live for your glory. Convict me of any sin because I, I want to live for you. That's where true joy and true happiness is. It's a time for you to recommit. Well, just as the bread and cup are being passed, maybe you have some confessing to do. Or Jesus, I need to be reminded of these things. Or convict me of any sin in my life because I, I want to be a pure vessel for you. I want to be zealous for those good deeds that you mentioned only because you've already purchased me. Because I'm forgiven. I'm your child. So men, band come. We're going to sing a great song. Hymn of Heaven. We're going to pass out the bread. Hold the bread and hold the cup and then we're going to joyfully partake it together. And just hold the bread and cup till the end and we'll eat it together. and Drink it together. Just think about all that the Lord Jesus has done for you and me.